here. Okay. Let me see. I see the Q&A. Somebody just put something in the q and I'm trying to keep all my screens open. It's just, just so hard on it. Oh. Janice from Tones Over. Hi. <laughs> oh, Patty, you froze there a little bit. Okay. All right. So we are recording. All right. So I want to say good evening to everybody. Since it's 7.01, um, we're just going to get started in the nick of time, so to speak. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight for caring of houseplants in fall and winter. Um, Jean, who uh, remains videoless today, uh, is sharing his PowerPoint with us. Um, so welcome, Jean. Thank you. Jean is one of our um, master gardeners in Ocean County. And uh, so if you guys are haven't been on one of our programs before, I'm Susan M. Hart Servideo. I'm one of the horticulturists at the Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Ocean County, and I actually run the Master Gardener program as well. And with us tonight is Patty Dixon, who is uh, the other horticultural culturalist in the office, and Jean Kramer, again, as I said, one of our master gardeners who is our presenter tonight. So I wanna thank everybody for coming on. Um, we do have your attendee, your videos and your microphones and your chat feature has been disabled, um, but the Q&A feature is open for questions. As the questions gets answered, you will see the answers as we as they come, um, as uh, Patty and I answer, and then um, we will ask Gene wherever their, uh, his uh, breaks are for his talks, uh, talks, question section. And then uh, our next program will be um, October 5th at 7 p.m. on vermicomposting. So worm composting, if anybody is interested, um, you can go to our website to register. There's the information on this slide. All right, Jean, I am uh, going to turn it over to you. And um, and would you have a set section for your question and answers? Oh no, anytime. If okay. if you want to jump in anytime, that's fine with me. Okay, we'll see what we see. We'll see what we have. We'll come up with, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. So I'm going to turn okay, mine my stuff off so that you can chit chat and on your merry way. <laughs> okay, thanks Susan, thanks Patty, and thanks everybody else for joining in too. And um, I apologize if I sound a little nasally. I have a sinus infection, so I hope I don't start coughing or sneezing through this, but we'll get through it, okay? Um, let's see, let's get started here. Okay, as Susan said, our program is caring for houseplants in fall and winter. And I'm going to talk about the benefits of indoor plants, moving indoors to overwinter, which will cover how and when, inspecting and treating for diseases and insects, pruning, repotting, or starting from cuttings. And then I'm going to talk about fall and winter care, which will cover light, water, temperature, humidity, feeding, and monitoring for problems. Jean, I'm going to stop you one second. I'm sorry, you yes. are coming over very underwater at the moment. Is there a way, can you, would you be able to try to take yourself off that second or I can try to drop you, the, your other person, your other persona that's on there? <laughs> if not, I'll take care it? of it. Yeah, let me try it. Um, let me see if I can, let me. Oops, to get you on a different way here. Sorry. Um, change rules. Um, so let me see if I can make that an attendee. All right, so I took you off there and you're muted. So I don't know, I don't, there's no other way. I don't know if it'll let me un, unattend you. <laughs> so you go ahead, you should be good to go. Okay. Does that sound better? I can still hear you. No, that's fine. Uh, it's better for now, but we'll go for it and uh, I'll work on it from my end. Okay. Okay. Among the benefits, often we see house plants as decorations, but there are a number of other benefits they provide. Humans are innately drawn to nature, which is called biophilia. Thus, having indoor plants reinforces our need to commune with nature. Caring for plants can fulfill our desire to garden when we're able, unable to do so outdoors. Just because you've only got house plants doesn't mean you don't have the garden spirit. I look upon myself as an indoor gardener. 
That's a quote from a garden blogger that I just happened to come across. Her name is Sarah Moss Wolf. She calls herself the traveling gardener. Jean, are you still there? Yes. Okay. I expelled your second. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, but you no, that's okay. It popped up that I have been removed from the event. Okay, but but your other does one's it on. sound better now? A little bit better. Yes. I don't know why. Okay, Maybe just have a, no, we might just have a bad connection. No worries. Okay. Shh, I'll be back. Quiet. Among the many benefits of indoor plants are aesthetics psychological, cleaning the air, and adding humidity. So there are physical benefits as well as the ones that please our eye and surroundings. If your house plants have had the luxury of a summer vacation outdoors, certain steps should be taken before moving them indoors. Part of my humor here, these are some of mine enjoying this summer on my patio. Um, the ways to move them indoors are one, you can move the entire plant in. And uh, this right here is a lipstick plant. And I, this is easy for me to move in because you, as you can see, it's in a hanging basket. And um, it's really free of any insects or um, contact with the outdoor soil that would have materials that may not want to transport back into the house. So. With a good visual inspection, I'm pretty comfortable moving this in. If I don't see anything on the leaves or the flower blossoms, I'm pretty sure that there's not anything dangerous that got in the soil. Or you can also transplant from existing pots. I make my own flower pots and hanging baskets, and I like to mix um, houseplants, especially in hanging baskets, like some trailing varieties of houseplants in with petunias and patients and things of that sort. So in here, I have a Tradescantia, which is known as Nanook. And um, it's already rooted in the pot, so I carefully dig that out and repot it, transplant it into another pot so that I can overwinter it and start it in the garden again in the spring. Here is a pothos that was also outside and um, like philodendrons and certain other plants, they're aerials. They grow aerial roots, and so they're very easy to just take a cutting. Right here is the root coming out of the stem right below the leaf. And if you just pot that in some fresh soil with good contact with the soil, it will quickly send down roots, and you don't have to worry about transporting any bugs or other insects problems that are fungus that might be in the soil from outside. Okay, inspecting for the insects and disease. Before bringing the plants indoors, always examine for signs of pests or disease. Use a magnifying lens and a good light. Check the tops and undersides of leaves and even lift the plant to inspect the soil for pests that may have entered through drain holes, particularly if the pot has been sitting on the soil. Um, I had a beautiful, beautiful spider plant out this summer, and I was so excited to bring it into my sunroom and hang it up for the winter. And I, but I know that that's one plant that like, um, it does well when it's root bound, but I thought maybe I should inspect it to see if it needs to be repotted before I bring it in. And I lit the whole plant up all the roots ball came right out of the pot. The shape of the pot was intact, but I had like like a massive ant farm. I have no idea where they came from, but I had it. They were sitting up on a little stool in the garden. It wasn't on the ground, but nonetheless, it became infested with ants. So then they also have aerial roots like the pothos that I showed you here. So I cut a bunch of babies off and started a bunch of new ones for the winter and I'll start over again in the spring with new baby um, spider plants. It was it was quite the sight when I lifted it. <laughs> it looked like a science experiment going on in the bottom of my plants. <laughs> but you, of course, you're going to look for um, any signs of 
either marks on the foliage, defoliation, chewing on the foliage, underside of leaf, you might see white fuzzy things there, mealy bugs, anything that looks suspicious, you wanna make sure you treat it some kind of way to get it off of there before you bring it inside. Because when the plants come inside, they're at least um, they seem to be more susceptible to harm when they're indoors because it's not their peak environment. It's not their preferred environment. We're just doing the best we can to create that environment for them indoors. So you want to make sure you're starting out with good, healthy plants. And if you do find anything, you want to treat them. Prevention is the best way to control disease. And the best way to prevent the disease is constantly monitoring them. Okay, so what you can start while they're outside and um, definitely way before you wanna bring them in the house, you wanna start a good inspection process and make sure that they're clean and won't infect any other plants indoors. Any plants that do have a problem, you wanna isolate them from um, any healthy plants and then identify the agent that's causing the damage. Is this something in the soil? Is this something on the leaves? Is this something temporary? Maybe some insect just chewed on it, but it's not there, didn't leave any residue behind or eggs or anything of that matter. Um, prune away the damaged areas and treat the problem with the appropriate treatment. Um, I prefer non-chemically when possible, but chemically if it's necessary. And carefully follow the treatment instructions and be certain it's safe for use on a plant being treated. There are some, like um, I, know, I know that um, succulents are very popular now. Crassula is the family that um, jade, the popular jade plant is in, are very sensitive to certain treatments. So. You want to make sure that the product you're using is okay to use on the plant that's being treated. I have some samples over here of ways to treat, um, and these these are fairly uh, safe. This is just regular household rubbing alcohol. You can um, inspect the leaves, take a Q-tip, dip it in the alcohol, and rub it and rub off any insects that might be on the. Uh, top or underside of the leaves. This is insecticidal soap, which is also fairly safe. And um, this, if you don't want to spray some chemical inside your house, is a systemic so that you work it into the soil, rinse it into the soil. The plant takes it up through its vascular system and um, it, it becomes an unattractive, unappetizing to the insects that would be damaging it. But again, with, you know, especially with the insecticidal soap and the um, and the uh, systemic plant disease control, you want to make sure that you follow the instructions and avoid any danger to your own person or the plant that you're treating. And unfortunately. Um, as I just told you about my spider plant, sometimes we just have to discard them if they're beyond um, saving. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's a good website that I cited here because um, I make a reference and you can refer back to this when we're done. But this particular site I have here, which you can click on, is a, is a live link. Um, it includes the recommended treatment information. So that's very handy. It's not just talk about how to treat. I mean, you know, what to uh, look for. It, it actually gives the recommended treatment for certain plants and their problems. Okay, um, I, I wish, in a way I wish we did this a month ago, but I'm, you're, you're, if you get going now, you'll be fine. But when to prep the plants for bringing them indoors? So ideally, you have monitored your plant's health throughout the summer. The results of effective disease and pest treatment may take time to become evident. Therefore, the earlier the problem can be addressed, the better. And the sooner the problem is addressed, the stronger the plant will be going into treatment, making it healthy and happy before moving indoors for the fall and winter. 
So like I say, if you haven't done it already tomorrow <laughs> or as soon as you can, it's really, it's really the time to get going on um, checking your plants and treating as required. Okay, when to move the plants indoors. Remember, most house plants originate in warmer climates. Please don't let them, let them suffer in the cold. House plants that have been outside for the summer thrive from the benefits of increased light, temperature, humidity, air circulation, etc. You should minimize the shock of moving them indoors by transitioning them before your home's heating system is turned on, which often increases the decreases, I'm sorry, decreases the humidity. And you should try to replicate the outdoor environment as much as possible. While they may survive some cooler or cold temps before moving them indoors, it is definitely not their preference and increases their stress and decreases their chances of survival. I want to stop for a minute at this um, point and talk, of, talk about the sources of information that we have for houseplants because um, as a master gardener and just interest in houseplants my whole life. Um, and now with the advent of social media, there's so many like plant groups you can join on Facebook and other other sites and they're really fascinating, but you have to like always keep in mind like who you're listening to, who's giving the advice. So one of the groups um, that I'm on, someone posed a question a couple of weeks ago, said, Anybody start bringing their plants indoors already? Someone wrote, I've got another five to six weeks here in Newportville, Pennsylvania. Someone said, I live in South Jersey and in the morning it feels pretty chilly, but the plants seem okay. So they're, they're not too bad. Um, let's see, I'm in South Jersey as well. I've been doing this for years. Plants are more hardy than we give them credit for. I wait until it's going to freeze, and I've never had an issue. <laughs> I'm like, wait, <laughs> this is like supremely the worst advice ever. They're tropical plants. <laughs> if you look at the information tags, they say they like, you know, um, like their lowest is like 65 or 60 or whatever is the case. I mean, this is just the craziest information. Some, some people don't even bother to say where they are. They don't talk about what kind of plant it is. It's just like the silliest stuff I ever see. Um, here's another one. Some I bring in when attempts hit a steady 50. Others I wait till it's 40, 45. <laughs> um, Oh, and then this is a good one. This is just so arbitrary. Um, mine go out, and again, listen, I'm telling you what I'm reading off the internet. This is not my advice, so just I'm just giving you some of the bad examples I see. Um, someone said, all of mine go out St. Patrick's Day and they don't come back into Halloween. Like this, that is so random and arbitrary and it's definitely not a good move for your house plants. They may survive, but you're really, you know, pushing the envelope here with stuff. So please, please, please make sure your sources of information are good. Okay. Gene, so you also, yes, go ahead. Sorry. On your handout that we sent out to everybody today, it does talk about how to find or do a search uh, so that you get reliable uh, information. So. If anybody needs it, send us an email and or send us a uh, a chat here and we'll get your email. Yes, and also since you brought that up, Susan, um, on the handout, the last link there is the opposite of what we're doing tonight. So you may want to hold on to it because it talks about acclimating houseplant to the outdoors. So it's the opposite. It's going to be the opposite of what we're doing now. Maybe I'll do a presentation in the spring about moving them out, but. It's a procedure. It's not the same procedure, but it's a procedure. You can't just throw them out in the full sun 
et cetera. You know, I mean, they may make it, but they're not going to be all that happy. This is a nice way to do it and a, and a bad way to do it. Okay. So, <coughs> oh, excuse me, excuse me. So continue to isolate the plants. Confine recently moved plants away from other plants for a brief period to monitor for any pest problems you may have missed and treat them accordingly. So this is like, not really proper isolation, putting them in a bird cage, but it's something. <laughs> okay, lighting. Um, let's see, I have to move a little something on my screen here. Okay. Know your plant's light requirements. For example, low, medium, or high. Proper lighting is critical to the health and vigor of a plant. Provide supplemental light, for example, LED, fluorescent, incandescent, and place them properly as needed. Um, what I say place properly is, the, you know, the, I mean the distance from the plant itself, okay? Because not only it's a measure of the light that the plant's receiving, if you use incandescent, for example, there's a lot of heat involved too. And so you may be burning the leaves. It's not just the, the um, rays that are, you know, the ultraviolet that the plants receiving is the heat that may damage them. But we are lucky enough now to uh, live in a time when you can find light meters that, and um, things of that nature to monitor the plants and make sure they're getting the proper light if you're interested in taking this hobby that far. I mean, of course, you can also monitor them with the eyesight and see if they look like they're reaching for the light or um, leaning a certain way. Lacking variegation is another sign that they may not be getting like a, um, like a pothos. Some pothos are very pretty marble queens and different ones that have a lot of white and silver type colors in the leaves, but if they're not getting um, the proper light, they're not going to show that. Or they may be tilting and um, stretching toward the light at an angle. It, that may be enough, not enough light, or maybe you just need to turn them more. There's some visible effects of the light on your plants. This is a Philadel philodendron birkin. And um, when I first got it, I didn't have it in enough light and the lower leaves became very dark. Then when I put it outside for the summer, look at the beautiful variegation I got in it when it was exposed to some more light. It's really a striking plant. And I, I wasn't fully appreciating it in the house in the winter when I didn't see all the beautiful colors. But um, we all make mistakes and here's, here's the same plant that um, I wasn't properly spinning to, to, uh, to deal with the light that was coming at an angle. So you can see that all the leaves are pointing this way. They're heading northwest or some direction here that's not, not appropriate. And I, sh I should have been paying better attention and um, avoiding that. I'm trying to correct it now with some staking and some better overhead light, but it could have been avoided if I had been paying attention better. And this is one from the other uh, slide we had a couple minutes ago, and it's another effect of the light. This is a philodendron jungle boogie right, right here, and it's on a shelf that's down here somewhere, and the lights are way up in the top and the bottom of a shelf above it. And um, it, it's doing okay, but it had a heck of a ride up here to get to the light. So it's all stretched out. It should be a nice little compact plant. But um, again, that's one, uh, one problem I'm trying to correct and do better this winter. So it's in a different spot. I just want to show you the effects of some of the things, you know, the light. All right, this is the most common question all the time, whether it's winter, summer, spring, or fall, how often should I water my plant? There's no general answer, um, except to say that in general, house plants require less frequent water during the winter months than in spring and summer. 
but but again, there's no specific. I can't tell you once a week, once every two weeks, once a month. It, it's water frequency depends upon the plant species, composition of the potting mix, environmental co conditions, which include temperature, light, and humidity in home and other factors. And one of, in fact, one of the other factors I was thinking of before I started tonight, I should have put in here, is the um, container the plant is potted in because like a glazed pot, a plastic pot, it's gonna hold a moisture. This, the, um, any evaporation of the water from the soil is gonna just come from the top. But if you use a clay pot, the side's very porous it's going to be losing water just through the sides of the pot. So there's so many factors, so many factors at the plant is, you know, also too, um, what, th these are house plan in winter rules, but I think most of us are not set up to provide optimum conditions for our plants. But if you are, I mean, if you have a greenhouse and you're doing the light and the humidity and the whole thing, then you can throw all these out the window because you're, you're, you're replicating this plant's preferred environment. It may grow a little slower just because of the natural light being a little less, but I'm, I'm talking about a general house plant, you know, gardening here. When water in the house plants continue to apply water till it flows out the bottom of the pots and discard the excess water. So, um, I had to borrow a hand model for some of these slides here. He was very good. But to uh, see here, this is, I like this. It's a giant syringe I got off of um, a website. And for some of my foliage plants that are really packed, like I can stick it in here between the leaves and get it in there without getting the leaves wet. And conversely, I say discard the excess water rather than lifting the pot up which you can stain your furniture and just make a general mess around the house. I can suck it up right out of here because a lot of times like I'll accidentally overflow it and I just grab the syringe real fast and suck it up. There we go. I have avoided a mess. The plant safe is very handy to have. It's one of my favorite things. Oh, and also I'm going to go back one slide where we just talking when I was talking about the porosity of the pots. I talk about the drainage of the pots. One other tip I wanted to mention, if you have, um, drainage is so important. If you have a portable drill in your house and you have pots that don't have drainage, one of the best things you can invest in is a masonry bit, trust me. Just put it in your drill. You're not gonna crack the pot. Everybody's gonna be happy. Nobody will know the difference that there's a hole in your mother's lovely vase or something that you just turn into a houseplant pot. <laughs> okay, temperature. Most houseplants tolerate normal temperature fluctuations. In general, foliage houseplants grow best between 70 and 80 during the day and 60 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit at night. Most flower plants prefer to sing daytime range but grow best at nighttime temperatures 55 to 60, but look up here. I say, this is a general rule. Most, I'm not saying all, you need to know your specific plant. Okay. This is just a general presentation here, but I, I want to stress that you need to know your specific plant needs. The lower night temperature induces physiological recovery from moisture loss, intensifies flower color and prolongs flower light. Excessively low or high temperatures can cause plant failures, stop growth, or cause spindly appearance and foliage damage or drop. A cooler temperature at night is actually more desirable for plant growth than higher temperatures. A good rule of thumb is to keep the night temperature 10 to 15 degrees lower than the day temperature. Winter humidity levels in the home are substantially below what most house plants require. This is like probably the most difficult um, environmental factor to get correct in your house in the winter, especially if you have forced hot air, heat, etc. Monitor 
the indoor humidity and take steps to increase according to specific needs. Here you can see I have a little um, temperature and humidity reader, hygrometer. I, they're very inexpensive too now. That was the reading very lovely there with a temperature of 75 and a relative humidity of 64, which your house is probably never going to have in the winter time. But there are things you can do to help. Okay, how to increase the humidity. Group your plants. Plants release moisture through their leaves in a process called transpiration. By grouping plants with similar similar humidity requirements together, you create a more humid microclimate in your growing area that will benefit all the plants. So here you see I have gathered all my African violets around um, a larger pot that has a palm in it. So they're there. And this section over here, so I, I kind of do this in my sunroom. I take little areas. This is just a group of succulents and I try to keep those kind of plants together. Put the plants in trays with pebbles and water. So, I mean, I mean, that sounds, that sounds a little crazy. It's actually like you setting the pot on top of the pebbles and then the, the pebbles are um, in water. Or use two saucers underneath and add water to the larger outermost saucer. That's one way so that there's always a, a source of moisture under the plants that's rising up and evaporating around the plant's foliage. Or use a humidifier, but be aware that the entire room will be humidified. So if you have plants that don't want that, you're not creating that um, micro environment for those plants that the whole area has become humidified now. Or you could plant in terrariums like I've done here and moisture will take care of itself in there if it's covered. Or you can miss often, but only apt plants. Certain plants will become diseased from having water on their foliage. For example, African violets. Um, and remember that missing provides a very temporary increase in humidity. So it's not going to last. You can do it a couple times a day, whatever strikes your fancy, but um, it's not going to stay real long. Feeding. In winter, most houseplants go through a rest period. During these months, growth slows as plants are exposed to lower temperatures and less natural light. As a rule of thumb, only fertilize houseplants when they are actively growing because plants only use nutrients when they are producing new leaves, roots, etc. If you're repotting in the fall or winter, avoid using soils with a heavy concentration of already added fertilizer. In conclusion, with a bit of effort and carefully monitoring to keep your plants healthy and fit, you will be rewarded with living things of beauty in your indoor spaces for years to come. And you would like be able to, as I do, move them outside, back and forth. They have a good life down here. So <laughs> that concludes my presentation. I'm sorry it's a little short, but if there's any questions. Great photo, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> this is called plant abuse, because I. <laughs> but the cactus yes, yes. has has healed up nicely from his arm <laughs> stuck into his side. It's cute. It's cute. It's cute. I know there's an echo when I talk, so I'm gonna keep myself somewhat muted from time to time. But um, there were uh, the one question I did answer it, but um, Mary had asked about discarding water that flows out of the bottom. Um, why should you discard it and and not use it for the next plant. Or you were, okay. I don't know that she, she was asking whether you should use it for the next plant or not. Oh, it doesn't hurt anything. Right. Not, I mean, I can't see why it would hurt. Yeah, I, I basically said the same thing, unless the plant's just showing a disease, you can yeah, still yeah. use it because you're only letting it 
sit in the bottom for about 10 to 15 minutes and then yeah, you're... I meant to score just so just in a sense that it shouldn't sit there too long like you said because it, it, I mean you get root rot or something right right wet feet playing. fun plants plants mm -hmm. don't like wet feet so all right go ahead uh Patty if you have a question yep um what can be done during the summer to avoid a fungus mass and b scale when they're brought in yeah, it was a tough one. Um, you should use some of the links there and see how to treat the scale. Um, the, the fungus gnats, you can use the mosquito dunks that you could put in like a bird bath or something to keep uh, mosquitoes and stuff away. And if, if you soak um, pieces of the mosquito dunk in your watering can and then use that water to water the plants, it should take care of the fungus gnats without any harm to to you or the plant or the environment. That was a good one. I hadn't thought of that. That yeah. works well. That works well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the scale, they're, they're really tough on house plants. I had a plant and I scraped them and Watch for crawlers and dab them with alcohol. And yeah, they're tough. They had to, I had to throw it away. It just yeah, the, you, sometimes it. you do. Scale's a tough one, really tough. Yeah. Um, another one. Mm -hmm. uh, do you recommend soaking the plants in soapy water? No. Now, are, I'm not sure if the person is asking soapy water on the plant leaves or soapy water on the soil so that i don't know if it makes a difference or you're saying no all which is i'm just bringing it up in conversation gene so no i mean i mean i'm um, insecticidal soap is a soap like treatment you know but i don't i don't know the proportion you would use and so i i would prefer myself to get the product that's insecticidal soap because i know it's already you know, in a proper concentration and stuff. And then, you know, like some of the other dish soaps and things that have the degreasers in them, that's not no bueno for your plants at all. You know, you have to be careful. So I would just say as a general rule, no, I, I don't see any benefit to that. Or uh, if you try it, you might be uh, taking your plant in into your own hands on that one. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. She, she just clarified she did mean dunking the pot in a soap, soapy solution. Oh. No. Okay. So, no. Yeah, and, th and then no. I think that would be for fungus gnats. I'm assuming that that's what she's possibly worrying about for soapy. Yeah, I haven't, um, I haven't heard of that treatment for fungus gnats. The best thing, honestly, the best thing is to use some of the sources that I listed on the reference sheet that was handed out to you and do some research from reliable sources on your own because again like i like i was giving you some of the answers that i found on my own one of my own garden um facebook pages about when to bring plants in and out there's a lot of bad information out there i personally never heard of dunking your plants in soapy water so i, I don't know anything about that no, but I think you can use your um, insecticidal soap um, products as a, I don't know if it's a soil drench, you would have to read the the product label to see if okay. you could use it in that, that's in that possible. manner. That's possible. Yeah, I've heard and of that drenches. Be, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that possible. Um, Jeremy asked, um, is there any list of really showy plants that will work both indoors and outdoors in central New Jersey? Um, and also are any plants that are indoor only and perennial without having a greenhouse? That's a toughie. I don't know of any lists myself, but. Well, I mean, I mean, it's the, the sites that I listed are doing the searches as we suggested on the thing. I mean, you can find the ideal plant for your environment, you know, whether, you know, you can search for low light plants or out, you know, outdoor, indoor, whatever you're looking for. If you do the search properly, you can find all kind of good advice that's reliable. 
Yeah, I, I, the only things I can think of, and, and Jeremy, whether it's um, indoors and outdoors, it really depends on your lighting situation. Uh, but crotons um, are good for a lower light, uh, like bright light in the house, but lower light outside. Um, yeah. Crotons have the have a multi. I don't know if you had any pictures of crotons. Um, I did. I did. I they do well. They do well yeah. in the house. And um, I just, you know, mine do so well in the house. I don't take all my house plants out for the summer just for the heck of it. Like right. some do so well in the house. I'm afraid. And crotons are. Um, well, actually, here's a croton that's outside. Here's the croton. Oh. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the uh, narrow leaf one. Yeah, that's pretty. Here, cool. Here's a uh, croton petra and here's a banana leaf croton. So they, they do well in the house. And like Susan said, they get bright light. They're not in, right next to the window. They're back from the window. They get a little like a lot of bright light, but indirect bright. So, you know, like I said, like I say, some of my plants just don't go outside because they they do well where they are. Some they don't like to be moved at all. They go, they drop their leaves and have like a hissy fit if you're not careful. So <laughs> <laughs> they do. They're prima donnas, some of them. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> um, go ahead, Patty. If you want to ask the next question, I, I see a couple on here, but I'm not sure. Yep. Um, someone said I have many small pots of ivy. They are prone to aphids when inside. They did well outside. I saw ants eating aphids. Um, but how to be proactive while bringing them inside? It's tough. I think you need to monitor, and you know that the um, insecticidal soap will work on the aphids. Mm -hmm. So you know you just want to really check them upside down, inside out. Check them before you bring them in. If you see the aphids, the um, you know, you know, the key is like really, really inspecting them before you bring them in too, because, yep. you know, things that do well outside. It's not because there's more bugs in the house. It's the bug you brought in the house doesn't have its natural predators either that were outside. Like you, you have changed everything up. It's not. It's not the same environment for the plant or the bug. So the bugs just go crazy because the plant's a little more stressed. It doesn't have its natural predators that it may have had outside. So you you're you're like um you know um advantage bugs, let's say that, you know, advantage to the bugs rather than the plants. So if you bring them in healthy and if there's a problem inside, you jump right on it. You should be able to yep. take care of it. But when I mean, it's a it can be a nightmare. Like the, when they get in and and if they get out of hand, you know, I, it's it's a shame. But it's sometimes it it just comes down to like having to get rid of things sometimes because it's it's like a never ending battle. You have to, you know, weigh the weigh out, you know weigh weigh the um, benefit versus the risks of treating it. It's a, like never ending. Yeah, I, I think mealybugs are that way for me, especially on orchids. Oy, orchids and cactus. I've tried a couple different things, and sometimes systemics um, just don't work. But systemic insecticide may be the answer when it's something that you are having a really tough time with. Um, or sometimes horticultural oils, but then some house plants don't like the oil. So, yeah, you yeah. do have to try a little trial and error um, for some things or sacrifice the one in the in yeah. the hopes to keep the many down. <laughs> so. One one thing I have totally given up on is um tropical hibiscus. I have they they're so pretty outside. I bring them in the house, mealy bugs like crazy. I I just said, all right, that's it. I can't. <laughs> they're like not being in my life anymore. There's more trouble. I I have never figured out the way to bring them in properly and keep them till the next year. And my mother did every year. No was no issues, but. I I'm hit or miss. Some years yeah, are better no. than others. No, yeah. no yeah. luck with them from me. Um, there was a question in here too. Um, John would like to know how many house plants do you have, and um, and has a question about African violets. I don't know how much you know about uh, specifically about African violets. Well, it's funny John asked that because I thought someone might. So I counted them before the presentation, and <laughs> I have 145. I think. <laughs> I may be at the point where I need an intervention. 
no, no, no. That's <gasps> that's a lot. When I say 145, that's like 145 pots. Some pots have more than you know, more than one. They're like little plants or dishes and varieties. So 145 at the moment. Well, I give you credit. You're living in pure oxygen almost, I think. <laughs> and you can't even see them. I'm so sorry my camera wouldn't work. I had a nice background here tonight. Yeah, well, take a pic take a picture of it and we'll send it out with the um okay, with your okay. uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so what did yeah. um what did what did he want to know about the African violets? The African violets about yellowing. Oh, there is um, some of his African violets have lighter colored leaves on the outer leaves. Is there a specific reason that you know of about why that's happening? Well, the outer leaves are probably also the lower leaves. So they're probably the older leaves. So there's a natural um, aging process and they're going to fall off and die. But if the plant and if the plants receiving too much water, probably they're the first ones to go. I would mm -hmm. suspect over water, but again, it could just be a natural process. Unless it's, you know, I mean, if it's an abundance of them, that's a problem, but it's probably the water. Yeah. And how old the plant is, too, sometimes yeah, that makes yeah. a difference on the African violets. The yeah, older they get plants real will have lighter. Stemmy. They get a real, they get real like a woody stem almost. The lower leaves fall off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, I do this to myself because this is how houseplant people are when. Like every time I'm trying to bring stuff in for the summer and the leaf falls off of something, I'm like, oh no, I have to save it. So, so like I brought some African violets in and I stuck them all, I stuck the leaves that fell off in the jar of water. Now they all grew roots. So now I have all these African violets I have to pot up, which I need like a hole in the head, but I couldn't just, you know, chuck them out. That would be plant killer. <laughs> Well, sometimes you have to be ruthless depending on how much is there. <laughs> I will say, um, my poor plants, uh, and I love orchids, but they're just, I, I forget. I, if you guys saw my comments to somebody's question, I forget to water. I suck at watering in the house and my poor plants have to be tough as nails. Um, I won't <laughs> show you what they look like right now. Cause they're all like, <laughs> but if you know that, if you know that that's the beauty of being able to do the research, you can find the perfect plant for you. Yes, that's why I have a house full of cactus and succulents. Yes. <laughs> How often you water them? And yep, Every and two months. And silk know. plants, silk flowers. Uh, I do have a few. <laughs> I won't lie. Outdoors, different I story. I try like everything new I hear about. I have carnivores, and now I just got bought a couple of Mexican. Um. Butter warts, not bladder warts, butter warts. Ooh, don't know that one. Warts. So I'm trying a couple of them now. I just like to try stuff. Yeah, yeah I was going to say we have to try and uh, do a propagation class too. We've um, talked, uh, Patty and I have talked a few times about um, doing propagation on houseplants and, and uh, showing people. So we were talking about doing some Facebook um, live uh views if anybody you don't have to, i don't think you have to be on facebook for there but you you might so we'll we'll keep that up to date if we can um there are some i think there was any other i just was... see um someone had their christmas cactus outside and the leaves got burnt so is there a way to save it yeah the leaves i mean is the whole plant burnt i mean I mean, you can't fix the burnt leaves, but the, if you move it and the new leaves come, they should be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd pluck off the burnt ones. Mm -hmm. But it might also be, might have gotten too wet from all the rain if it was outside too long. So that, that could be something that you want to keep an eye on too. So depending yeah. on what, why it's brown. Could have gotten burnt, some burnt. So. Someone wrote uh, that um, about their Christmas cactus that every time a little segment falls off, they feel guilty if they don't replant it. See, that's what I'm talking about. Uh-huh. <laughs> But people come in to us and also ask us, they've got this 40 year old plant from their aunt that they've kept babies from, or even the main plant. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, not crazy. I mean, it's wonderful, but it, it's, it's, uh, it is crazy. It is their babies uh, and they need yeah. to have, um, 
actually Nancy in the beginning mentioned about she has cathedral ceilings and she's bringing in her, her or her large um, house plants from outside inside. But I think when you were asking, she asked the question, how does she deal with those? And I think it was partly about the, um, now I have to look back because it's all the way in the beginning um, regarding the uh, pots you were talking about repot repotting when you bring things yeah. in um, yeah. and checking for insects in the soil. Yeah. And that's the tough one. In the soil. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're really uncomfortable with that, just repot them or, you know, rinse the soil off, repot them or just treat them systemically. If, if it's really a problem, you know, if you're really concerned about that. Mm -hmm. And I also, for those people that might have uh, larger than life plants now, uh, and they don't want to prune them, um, you may want to contact a local garden center that may offer overwintering of house plants. There are plant sitters, um, but the one thing is, is they won't take, you know, some of the plants uh, you have to be careful because they may not want to take plants that are diseased, of course, because then it'll affect other people that may also have yeah. some plants there. So, right. but right. you can look into it for anybody that's got a large, a uh, large collection like Jean um, that <laughs> needs to uh, bring it inside and doesn't have the room and I don't have the room anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there was another some of question. My neighbors, some of my neighbors ask their uh, neighbors, other neighbors, if they can, like, you know, overwinter one of their large palms or something, even in their garage and stuff that's heated over the winter. They, it just, there are things you can do. Mm -hmm. But just make sure that you know you you, you treat the you treat your neighbor nice, <laughs> yeah. so that they'll let you do so. Um, uh, Nancy was asking about orchids, and I know that's kind of a whole nother section on its own. She just has orchids in in general, but uh, she doesn't say what the question is. But um, how about herbs? Sally is asking about do herbs from the garden do well if brought inside? I know the answer, well, but I'll see what you, you come up it's with. It's not really like a house plant, although. They're promoted that way lately, I guess, right? The windowsill herbs and stuff. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I yeah. suppose if you can provide the proper light and stuff. Usually though, it's tough to bring herbs from the garden at inside and then put them back out again. They're just like, it's just, you're better off starting with either leaving them inside and having a grow lights with them um or treating them inside and then putting them out for the summer in just one season um yeah. basil is that way that does not do uh, very well in the house over time to begin to start from seed and go yes you're good with that but or yeah. one of the hydroponic you know some one of the hydroponic systems and stuff like that but sometimes um rosemary can get very powdery mildewy inside and outside but so there, there are some problems with doing your herbs indoors that's that's an that's another like social media a marketing campaign really i mean they you know like what what um at christmas time you see the things you can grow your herbs and stuff it's 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 a little gimmicky it's it's but i mean if you want to try it and you have the right spot you know and i have had people that have had them for maybe a year <laughs> inside before they just it got too leggy or just it really yeah. depending on the lighting that you have yeah. so it would be one that i would you know you could try it like jean said um john said he has 57 plants but he planned to get rid of them uh in the 57. plant sale but the sale was canceled from covid oh they have a different oh. plant sale where john is oh, yeah i was i thought john was gonna say he had 57 and he was gonna get 100 more <laughs> you might you might say that later in the in the question. <laughs> um, um, let's see. So here's here's an interesting one from Mary. She's asking if this is a credible approach to deal with um, hitchhiking soil soil borne pests. Would it be plausible to let them sit in a bucket of water for fifteen to thirty minutes? To kind of force the insects to either come up to the surface or drown. That's interesting. I like sure. that. Why not? Give it a, give it a shot. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not keeping the plant. You're, oh, sorry, Jean. I don't mean to butt yeah. in. I know. I just, I don't know. I don't know if that would work. Does it depend what kind of bug it is? I don't know. 
I'd say give it a shot since it's only 30 minutes. Um, yeah. You know, and then you're letting it drain back out. So as long as you're not leaving it for more than an hour in water, I think you're probably okay. But 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 it would it would it be effective? Like as is the is that insect eggs? For right, example, it's not one hundred. You know, right, like like not affected by that treatment because of the state it's in versus the adult insect, right. or I I don't know how effective it would be. That's I would agree with you on that, Gene. It would yeah. depend. Mm -hmm. So yes, on I think that would work for uh, adults or or possibly nymphs that are not in a, that are in a stage where they have to breathe and ha and not be in a wet area. But like yeah. eggs that that may serve, yeah, you might have to go through a few cycles of, yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, there was another. Uh, someone did ask, uh, do you can you prune your plants before or after getting them indoors? Should you, I guess, prune? Salma was asking that. Oh, just for the sake of pruning, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to prune unless you feel that you need to keep the yeah. size. But if you want to do it just because, I mean, it does, the plant doesn't, it wouldn't matter to the plant whether it's indoors or out. Okay. All right. Um, there was, um, oh, so there was something, I'm sorry, I'm trying to watch uh, some of the questions here that are popping up again. Um, can you explain systemic insecticide? And if you can't, I will, but that was a question somebody brought up. What, yeah, what's I mean, the difference it, between? Yeah, I, I will try. I mean, basically it gets in the soil, the plant root system takes those insecticidal chemicals up through the plant itself and it becomes distasteful and attractive to the insects that are attacking the plant. So they're, they're left, they leave it alone because it, it's not, you know, it's no longer desirable to them. I'm not scientifically how it works. So, so it, it is um, a bit of a distasteful, but it also is a poison as the insect is eating it. So it okay. poisons them as well. So okay. the insect will eat a little bit. So you might get some damage or if there's plant sap suckers, um, they'll get that in and um, it'll it'll kill them. Um, so that's one way. That's why it does work, but it does take some time yes. for the insecticide to work. So it's a systemic one. So usually about two weeks. So you could treat it with a foliar spray and do the treatment so that it'll take about two weeks for that to to get up into the plant, depending on how big your plant is. You know, I'm and talking more a shrubby type. Yeah, it will tell you on the container, like for the size of pot, how much, how much um, powder you should use, and and it do, it does need to, it does um, go away. It does need to be re-added to the soil over time too. It doesn't stay in the soil forever. Yeah, they say approximately three to four weeks, but again, yeah. it depends yeah. on the product you're using. But you have to be careful too, like you know, make sure you read. I'm always worried about the safety. Like you don't want to inhale it or anything while you're putting it down. It's very fine, so just be and very if, cautious. If you have cats that like to play in your soil, <laughs> if you have floor plants, um, for those of you that may have cats that like to use something as a litter box, um, yeah, that's a problem. Um, so uh, keep the keep the cats out of that. Um, put rocks, uh, the bigger. Um, goose egg rocks or whatnot around the soil to keep the your cat from digging and creating its own litter box. <laughs> I had to have that that happened before. <laughs> um, there was one one question. I, I don't know if you know this one, Jean, but I, I do. Um, it's uh, Karen was asking that or saying that her sister has perfected the watering of orchids by every Sunday. She puts two ice cubes in the pot. The plant is gorgeous. Now, I know. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I know that um, even a lot of the the growers' instructions that come with a plant say that, but mm -hmm. it's cold water. One thing exactly that that's a little shocking to the root system. Most most plants indoors would prefer um, like a room temperature water on them. So if you if you can, I, I mean, I I. I take a little bowl of water, I set the plant and let it suck up all the water at once to for a few minutes. And when it feels nice and moist, I just take it out and put it back where it belongs. That's a good way too. And I yeah. and the orchids though, that is a uh, that is a big um selling gimmick, uh or not gimmick really, 
it, taking two ice cubes and, and, and using it for the plant and doing it in a timely fashion is usually pretty good for a phalaenopsis orchid. Phalaenopsis, yeah. That's the one orchid. they usually, yes, that's the one they yeah. usually recommend that for. But as Jean said, it's ice cubes. It's 32, it's frozen water and <laughs> orchids grow in the tropics. <laughs> so yeah. they, you know, it could be a problem if those ice cubes are on the roots or the leaves of the plant for some reason. So if it's just on the soil, it would prefer to be room temperature. So try to, so try to guesstimate, you know, what's in two ice cubes and give it room temperature that same amount. And it's, and to be honest, it is the, um, it, it, it does melt, but, um, oh my goodness, I forgot what I was just going to say something about the ice cubes. Um, it's well, working you know, for her, so if that works for her, that's that's yeah. Fine. Well, I mean, I get I get the, the the thought behind it too that the ice cubes melting, so therefore it's going into the plant plant very slowly. Whereas if you just water through the plant, I mean, the orchid soil is like bark, really. It's very like loose, like bark, so it's not going to hold a lot of water. That's why I prefer to set mine in a bowl of water, and let it let the roots become, you know. Um, engorge with water that way on its own time, because if you just pour it through, it's going to run through so fast. Patty, if you've got some other questions, I'd, it is eight o'clock, so I just I, I we can stay on for a few a little longer too, because there are some great questions in here. I'm answering one um, on here quietly uh, to personally, so I, I don't want to interrupt. But if Patty has any others popping up. Um, the, um, awesome. I think the last one I see here is how to get rid of spider mites off of alocasia. Off of what? Um, it's like an elephant ear type plant. Oh, alocasia? Alocasia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alcohol. Insecticidal soap, systemic, you know, whatever, you know, whatever you have to do. And again, um, one of the sites I mentioned, I think it was Clemson.edu, um, even gave the specific treatment for specific insects. So, you you know, where my presentation was more general, if you go to some place like that, you can find out very specific information for your specific you, plants and problems. Can you flip to that slide that you had that on? I just wasn't able to put that in the chat box. Sure, let me find it. It's not too far from this group, I think. I have yeah. to say, one of the things I do with my HEIC.clemson.edu includes recommended treatment information. One thing I do when I start bringing in my leafy house plants is I stick them in the bathtub and I give them a shower. I kind of wipe oh, sure, definitely. the top and wipe underneath. You know, and it's not going to get everything off, but it's certainly going to help cut down on the problem. So everybody gets a little shower yes. when they come in. And then, you know, a couple months later or a month and a half later, everyone goes back in the bathtub and gets another shower. <laughs> um, and, and I do that until I put them back out. Yeah, no, that's a good thing. And I'm glad you brought that up because it also, I mean, the leaves are the plant's breathing mechanism too. So you want it to be clean and free of dust and stuff too. So, and it's going to collect dust in the house because it's not outside getting rained on, getting wind blowing across it. So, you, you know, that's a very, very good point, Patty. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, and, and you're knocking some insects off too at the same time, particularly if you're getting ready to bring it in the house. So that's a very good idea. Yeah, they like it. They always look a little bit happier after they get yeah, the shower. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they cut and gets the dust off. It, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Good for their yep. health otherwise, too. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, Rosemary just made a comment. She said cuttings of rosemary and lavender do well in the house. And they do um, if you're doing cuttings in water, uh, but eventually they will need to have, or they should have some soil based. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> unless Jean's had, <laughs> that's okay. Unless Jean's had other, um, other opportunity or difference? No, you can always use the rooting hormone powders and stuff too, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think propagation, somebody said a propagation class sounds good and your spring, sorry, I'm a little, uh, and your spring um, bringing your plants out, getting your plants to go outside. Yeah, that would be fun. We could do that too in the, in the mm -hmm. spring for sure. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, a, that's an excellent one too. 
Um, I like. Yeah, I so really like to incorporate things into my hanging baskets outside, like um, Travis Canches, um, pothos, spider plants, different things like that. They just oh, Boston ferns. I have a big Boston fern I keep in the house over winter. I take it outside in the spring. And take my little spade and chop it up into six or seven and put it in hanging baskets and plant a patients around it. I saved all kinds of money and it looks beautiful as it grows in. Mm -hmm. I actually did for a client one year and when I was doing retail horticulture, um, a client we did, um, they had the shady spot and she's like, I can't grow, you know, in patience. What else can I put in? And we did multicolored houseplants, ferns and yeah. pothos and uh, the Tradescanthia, we we did, it was great. It looked, it was, and it looked so lush. So it was really a, a nice, um, I don't know that what they did with them in the winter, uh, but it was a nice, something different. Well, I just take enough cuttings to keep them going to start over again in spring. It's just like a cycle I do. And I'm really, I'm I'm really pleased with um, some of the different varieties of Tradescanthia. I never had in a nook before, but it's really pretty pink pink and green and white, like pastel colors. It's very pretty. Yeah, I get, like it. So I want to, um, Gina, I want to thank you. It was great presentation as always. Um, thank you. You're great always job, just Gina. really, yeah, you, you're, you're always right on. So um, I want to thank you again. I want to thank everybody that joined us tonight. Um, so if you guys still have questions that we weren't able to get to, please email uh, Patty or myself, or you can uh, respond to the thank you for watching email um, and uh, you know, just, just come and contact us and we can uh, try and help you pinpoint what you might need to do for your plants. And I wanna thank everybody again and uh, October 5th for our vermicomposting and Sandra Blaine Snow from Ocean County uh, Recycling Center will be helping us uh, with that one. So I wanna thank, again, I keep saying thank you, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone. Yeah. So have a good night. Yes. And we'll Susan, see you all I'll soon. I'll send you some pictures of my sunroom tomorrow so you could send them out, okay? Perfect. That would be awesome. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank right. you. Bye-bye. Yep. Thanks, everybody. everybody.